Fun little known fact for you, the M20A1 Super Bazooka is actually one of the most effective weapons ever manufactured if judged on a weight to awesomeness ratio. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House taking a look at some of, well, some of the anti-tank rocket launchers that are going to be for sale in their upcoming uh, fall of 2017 firearms auction. And this specifically is an M20A1B1 Super Bazooka. This was the standard and really quite effective US anti-tank weapon uh, in the Korean War. Now. Unfortunately, this one is actually deactivated and not a live weapon, so I guess on the plus side that makes it a lot easier to own legally. On the downside, it's not actually functional. And I'll show you exactly what they did to deactivate it in a minute. But um, a little bit of backstory on this first. The US is one of the few countries that went into World War II without really anything in the way of an infantry anti-tank weapon. Uh, most of the major militaries had some sort of weapon, usually an anti-tank rifle, that gave a detached infantry unit some way to actually effectively fight light armored vehicles. So with the British, this was the boys' anti-tank rifle. Uh, the Germans had a couple Panzer Buxa uh, anti-tank rifles. The Russians built anti-tank rifles, although they did it a little bit later in the war. The US never had a, a heavy anti-tank rifle per se. They did some experiments with turning the 50 caliber Browning M2 into one, but those never went anywhere. And the closest thing the U.S. ever had was anti-tank rifle grenades. Well, the problem was they weren't very good at the beginning of the war. And by late 1942, there was a solution to this problem, and that was the M1 Bazooka. Uh, I'll touch on the name at the end of the video, where that came from. But the Bazooka is basically it, a five-foot-long metal tube that uh, fires a self-contained rocket with a, uh, a shape-charge warhead. So the idea is... At, by 1942, the ability of a typical, a conventional projectile weapon to defeat tank armor was going fast, if not completely gone. Those anti-tank rifles depended on simply velocity and the hardness and sharpness of a projectile to be able to physically punch through armor. Well, with a shape charge warhead, you, could, you had to have a, a bigger projectile but you didn't have to have a conventional firearm action. You could have something like a bazooka that didn't have to contain all the pressure of a, a bullet firing. And then that shape charge warhead could use basically chemical properties, the, the shaping of an explosion to funnel the power in a directed area. It could use that to become far more effective at armor penetration than just a kinetic projectile. And that's the way um, armor perforating weapons have gone ever since. So, the U.S. introduced the bazooka in late 42. It was, at that point, a 2.36-inch uh, weapon. And it was pretty effective at first. Started to have some trouble by the end of the war. Um, the U.S. started developing this, the heavier 3.5-inch version of the weapon, um, even during mid to late World War II. The M20, which was the first main 3.5-inch U.S. bazooka, was type classified or adopted in 1945, although it didn't go into production until 1948, so it really didn't see any World War II use. Uh, but it would see a fair amount of use in the early days of the Korean War. Uh, troops in the Korean War were armed initially with the old M1s, uh, but they managed to get more and more of these M20s uh, into the hands of troops. And in the early period of the Korean War, when there was actually a reasonable amount of tank combat, they proved to be quite effective. Um, it's interesting. This can penetrate, the, the shell on this can penetrate like 11 inches of armor. It's a, a ton of armor. Um, and that's way up from the 3 inches that the original M1 uh, 2.36 inch bazookas were capable of going through. However, this still had one potential flaw from sloped armor. And that's, I know what you're thinking, that's not because the sloped armor makes it effectively a, uh, a longer path to actually penetrate. The problem is the bazooka shell had an impact fuse, so it would hit crush and detonate, and if you hit armor at too great of a slope, you actually wouldn't hit the nose of the round square on enough to detonate, and the round would simply skip off. Not because the charge was insufficient, but because it didn't actually impact the, the target at the right angle to detonate in the first place. I think there were a number of troops who didn't quite understand the mechanics of how that shell actually worked, and 
were remarkably pissed off to see shells bounce, literally bouncing off of enemy tanks. At any rate, as long as you understood how to use this weapon, it was a really effective weapon. A uh, couple of advantages, it has literally no recoil because nothing is contained here. This isn't even like a quote-unquote recoilless rifle, uh, which does actually recoil somewhat. Um, this is just a tube to guide the rocket. It has no muzzle flash, although it does have a remarkably huge amount of dangerous backblast. Uh, the primary danger area on this thing is a 25-yard square area, um, out to 75 yards where there's a potential hazard. So. Uh, I, I read an interesting anecdote from the Vietnam War with some Arvin troops who had these, and you know, when one of these things came up to, the, to a combat line, you never really necessarily knew exactly where they were going to be firing it, because maybe you couldn't see the tank or you didn't know if they saw something that you didn't. But what you did know was that you did not want to be behind that thing, because that's, that's really dangerous to be behind. And so there's this anecdote from an Arvin commander saying that when one of these things showed up on the line, Anyone who could see it, their immediate priority became getting away from the rear end of that thing. And so people tended to stop shooting at the enemy and take cover. And if the gunner of this thing was kind of searching for a target and aiming to one side and then moving, it was like this comedy of errors where every time he moved, all the guys that were now behind him would, would scatter to get away from the potential backblast, not knowing when it was going to fire. Um, how much of that was a, a real systemic issue? Well, probably not. More so in the jungle where guys are closer together. Um, that wasn't really reported as a, a real problem for American troops. Anyway, this is the M20A1B1. So the M20 was the early version of this thing. It actually had a bipod on it, had a rear monopod on it, had a couple other features uh, that were deleted with the A1 version. That saved a couple of pounds. This thing only weighs 13 pounds. Uh, it is remarkably light for its size. And then the B1 designation means it's because there were two different manufacturing methods for these. One was the M20A1 and one was the A1B1, just indicating the alternative manufacturer. So the significant majority of the ones that are out there are the B1 style, including this. Uh, we have an optical sight. We have a couple other cool features. Uh, so let me go ahead and show you how to take it apart and how, we, how it actually functions. And uh, yeah, we'll take a look up close. All right, first things first, this bazooka is too long for me to get the whole thing in a close-up camera shot. So I need to make it smaller. This is the same problem you would run into if you were trying to transport this thing around or in an armored personnel carrier or a jumping out of an airplane or any number of things. So I'm gonna push this lever in. There we go. And then I can rotate the front half of the barrel and unlatch it from the rear half. Now we have a much more compact piece. If I want to transport this, I can now lock this into that and then use this spring-loaded catch at the front. And now I have something that's only about two and a half feet long and you can actually carry around, especially using the carry strap. So much more convenient this way. Pretty much all the cool bits are right here in the middle, so let's move on to that. We have an optical, a reflector type, optical sight, that is mounted on an integral bracket here. That's one of the changes to the A1 version. On the standard M20, this was bolted on. Uh, and then we have, let's see, the, the sight itself folds out. And then we've got this pivot. Uh, this is our standard sighting position. Uh, goes from basically zero out to 450 yards in, was it 100 yard increments? And then if you want to go farther, you've got five through 900 out here. Uh, the effective range of this thing was really like two to 300 yards. Um, but I suppose if you were just trying to fire area effect high explosive instead of targeting a specific vehicle, you know, then those longer ranges could make sense. Um, and you'll note that in order to do that, because of the the drop of the rocket, they have to physically rotate the sight uh, to a significantly different angle than your direct fire or your close range settings. There is also a little metal cover piece there, a lens cap, so you'd flip that up before you use it. Firing this uses just a standard trigger. There is a safety selector on here, fire is at the top, safe is at the bottom. Safe just blocks the trigger 
Uh, the firing mechanism here is very simple. It's basically just an electrical connection. When you click this trigger, you are actually creating a spark. Think of it like the, uh, the spark igniter on a gas oven. The original World War II bazookas used batteries. It was superior to, uh, to not have batteries and not need to worry about them. What you have here, and then running all the way down the length of the bazooka is the electrical connection. And then it runs to this box with a lever on the back. That lever is a, the really most significant improvement of the M20A1 over the M20. On the original M20, you would put the rocket in the back and then you would have to wind a wire from the rocket around a contact post on the back of the bazooka in order to make an electrical connection to fire. That was a significant pain and uh, so they replaced it with this. In this one, uh, the forward position here is for loading and once the rocket's loaded, you flip that into the upward position and it's ready to fire. What this does when it's down, it allows you to just push the rocket all the way in until it stops. Uh, with the earlier model and the World War II bazookas, you would kind of slide the rocket into the back, or your assistant gunner would, I should say, um, and just you'd kind of roughly judge exactly where it was positioned. It didn't make much difference as long as the electrical connections were in place. On this one, the, electric, the electrical connections are now fixed into the back of the tube, and so with the lever down, you just push the rocket in until it hits the stops and then you know it's in the right position. Once it's loaded, you put it in the fire position and that's going to lock the rocket in place so it can't slip out the back. Well, not lock it in place. It's going to prevent it from slipping out the back, will not prevent it from going rocketing out the front. So we can see some of what's going on here by looking in the back of the tube. There's a stop right there. This is the load position. That's the fire position. This right here is actually your, uh, your electrical connector and it's spring loaded. So what you do is run the rocket in until it hits that fixed stop at the base. Uh, at that point, it will be pushing properly on that electrical connector. You then switch this and now the stop in the front goes down, recesses into the tube and you have a stop here at the back that prevents the rocket from coming out backwards. So this is your second connector that's going to attach over the fin of one of the rockets. And that ensures that everything's properly lined up and ready to fire. Back here, we can also see one of the two things that was done to deactivate this. Uh, in the US, according to law, in order to deactivate a destructive device like this, you have to have an obstruction in the bore that prevents a, a loaded round from being put in. That would be this bar welded in place. And then you also have to cut a hole that is the muzzle diameter in the body of the weapon. It's a little hard to see, but that hole is right here. It's really obvious on the inside. Um, this was originally cut in the main tube and then someone has patched it from the inside with just a little thin sheet of tin or something. Looking down there, you can see that patch on the inside. So uh, this is still, I mean, even if you took the bar out, this would totally not be safe to shoot. That would be a huge problem. To, uh, the rocket would blow that thing right out. Um, however, being patched like that and painted over, it looks really good as a display item. All right, the camera doesn't really want to focus on the reticle here. I can only get a little bit of it at a time, but what you have are these center stadia lines with then wind holdovers because wind is going to have a huge impact on where your rocket goes. And then over here at the edge, we've got our range markings. So zero, one, two, three, and 400 yards. Now if I can see it at the bottom, there we go. We have one other little marking about the actual shells being used uh, in that reticle, but then that is what you would use to aim. Sorry, I can't get a better visual in there. Some of these old optics are just really hard to, uh, to get with the camera. Ultimately, these served in the Korean War as a primary weapon. They were still in service or used in the Vietnam War, uh, both by the US and by Arvin, uh, South Vietnam. They were used by a wide variety of other countries. Uh, the French used these in both Algeria and Indochina. You know, uh, US provided this sort of thing as uh, military aid to a whole wide variety of countries. You know. uh, by the later half of the 1960s, however, this was replaced in, uh, as the primary US armament. It was replaced with a 90 millimeter uh, recoilless rifle. Those would go on. Those had some pros and cons. They were a lot heavier. Ammo was lighter. They had a longer range. They were more accurate, but and anyway. Uh, we'll talk about one of those on another day. Ultimately, we 
pretty much go back to rockets with the M72 law. So if you'd like to have this one, of course, the pro and the con is that it's deactivated. That means it's a lot easier to own. Uh, no particular paperwork or anything to go to. Doesn't even qualify as a firearm legally. Uh, of course, it does mean if you happen to have a basement full of uh, three and a half inch bazooka rockets, you are not able to use them in this. Sorry, you'll have to find one somewhere else. Uh, at any rate, uh, take a look at the description text below if you're interested. You'll find a link there to the Julia catalog page on this guy. You can take a look at their pictures and description, and you can place a bid online or over the phone, or you can come to Maine and participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.